Bible, and it's in Psalm 73, and it's in verse 22. So it says, So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. So foolish and ignorant was I. Is that what he said? I got to read that again. And ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Now, if you're ever going to make progress with the Lord, the one thing that the Lord, you know, the Lord has a great sense of humor. I've always found out, I always thought, you know, to, to come in contact with the Lord, the God Almighty, he's the greatest being in existence. And he actually, he's outside of all of creation. We understand that, but God, God has a great sense of humor. Did you ever know that? He loves to have fun. <laughs> he does. He loves for his children to be happy and glad. To enjoy, you know, the word says in so many places, he gives us richly all things to enjoy. He wants our life to be full and blessed. And sometimes we have been our own worst enemies. That's why I'm looking to these the verse where it says, I was so, did he say so foolish? Yeah, so foolish. Not just foolish, but oh, so, so beyond just foolish, but so foolish was I and ignorant. You know, you're going to make progress with the Lord if you'll admit sometimes, oh Lord, I was ignorant. Or, Lord, oh, I was foolish. Would you forgive me, Jesus? Would you forgive me, Lord? Would you help me? God, you know, you are not going to make progress with the Lord by trying to fool the Lord. I have a note here that said, we must realize that God cannot be fooled. It says it right there. We must realize that God cannot be fooled. We must come clean. He knows our thoughts, our actions from the day we're born to the day we die. All is open before him with whom we have to do. God knows all about it. So we can't fool the Lord. Sometimes it's, it's the wisest thing we can do to say, so foolish was I and ignorant I was as a beast. So tonight I want to look at some beastly behavior sometimes that has gone on in our lives. Sometimes we've acted like animals. I don't know if you will agree with that, but the psalmist here says this. And this is a very interesting psalm. You know, just from reading the psalms, your soul can be blessed. You know, Billy Graham said he read five psalms a day and one proverb. If he didn't get to do anything else, he would just read five psalms and a proverb. Sometimes, you know, you, we're not saved by doing rituals and having hard and fast rules. But sometimes if you don't know what to do, just read five psalms and a proverb. There's enough to last you through the whole month. And I was reading this uh, several times. And in verse 1 it says, it starts out, it says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. And that's the key. He starts off on the right, uh, right on the note. He said, God is good to Israel, even to those that are of a clean heart. God's interested in our heart being cleaned up. Not having a dirty heart or a dirty mind or a dirty life, but having a clean life before Him because God is a holy God and He wants us to be holy. Yes. He wants us to be sanctified. That means separated from the things of this world. God lives in an environment that is so pure, that is so clean, it's so awesome, it's so different from our current world that people... Uh, the, the common person on the street would be, be a gas. It would be an abomination for them to, to step foot in heaven. The lost person, they would disintegrate because it's not made for the sinner. It's not made for the impure. It's not made for the unclean. It is made for human beings who, are be, who will be holy. That's the whole purpose of God, to make us holy. And we're holy by through the blood of Jesus Christ, by the sacrifice on Calvary. Calvary. He makes us holy because of the burial, the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It makes us, it did something legally and spiritually and morally in the, in the uh, awesome uh, panorama of the universe. 
This one act, God intervening, he came to make us holy, to make us pure so that we could enjoy his presence. And even being saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, when you enter into his, the fullness of his presence, it's so awesome that it knocks you out. Yes. Knocks you out. But he, look, look what he said. God is good to Israel, even to those that are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. And he, he goes through this, uh, this scenario of when he's, he's looking at certain things of life. And he says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are, there are no bands in their death, and their strength is firm. And they're not in trouble as other men. And, and neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain, and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, and they have more than their heart could wish. They're corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, and they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and the waters are cup are full of all these different things. And they say, verse 11, how doth God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly. They prosper in the world, and they increase in riches. And then he said, well, I, it looks like I verily have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in, in uh, innocency. For all the day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I'll speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. In these first 16 verses, he's talking about the strange predicament. I'm looking at people out in the world. They seem to be doing just fine. They got new cars. They're enjoying their riches and their houses and their lands. And everything seems to be going smoothly. But look at me. I'm suffering. What's in it for me? I, you know, I've washed, cleansed my hands in vain. What, what's in it for me? What's it all about, Alfie? You know, they used to sing back in the 60s. Oh, what's life all about? But did the people really search for the answer? The great, you know, the great things of the world. Oh, what's it all about? Where are all the answers? Well, you find some of the answers when you get down on your knees and start talking to the Lord and stop hiding and quit fooling around because God cannot be fooled. He likes people to come clean and be honest before him. If we need help, we cry, Lord, I need help. And then God says, okay, I want you to study and find out the help that I've provided and start receiving the help that I've provided. I, I gave you this, I gave you that, but you've got to take it to yourself. Like the sister was saying, God's provided so many things for us. And sometimes people wonder why. Well, sometimes, you know, like I told Sister Fran, sometimes we have been the ones in the past that have been taking down bricks brick by brick, in the hedge, in the wall of protection that God built around us. It's not been the Lord. But we sometimes, have, by the things that we've said or the attitudes that we've entertained, we were, the, we were the ones that were taking down bricks in this wall of protection that he built all around us. It's not the Lord. But, but listen, listen to what he said in the next verse. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Oh, then understood I their end. Oh, you know, when we go into the house of the Lord, where the saints are gathered, where they're praising the Lord, then suddenly our mind can change. So many times in my life, you know, I've wandered in my own ways, but then, then to go where the saints of God are, to go into the house of the Lord, and to sense the Spirit of God moving and showing me some things and saying, you know, uh, there's something greater than the things of the world. The pleasures of the world are short-lived. The pleasures of sin are but for a season. God wants me to have a blessed eternity. Yeah. When I went into the house of the Lord, he said, and then I entered into his sanctuary. Then I understood. If your people are, <laughs> that's why I said there's a grace that's given out. If we don't understand, if we don't understand the turmoil and the battles that are happening all around us, don't stop going to church. 
Go to the sanctuary. Go to the house of the Lord. It's too easy to get upset and say, well, I'm angry at this one. Or I'm angry at that one. That's the easy way out. But keep going because God sees our obedience and he sees he'll see our submission that we're doing the right thing and trying to understand and then he will give us a grace to know what's going on in our lives we're in a battle with unseen forces and we run into some of these unseen forces every once in a while when we find us a somebody that comes along in our life with a strange attitude. You say, well, where'd that come from? There are people in battles. They're in the battle, the struggle of their life. But he said, when I went into the house of the Lord, I began to understand. Surely you set them in slippery places. You catch them. You cast them down in destruction, verse 18. How are they brought into desolation? In a moment, they're utterly consumed with terrors. You see, when we're outside of the sanctuary, when we're outside of the fold, you think you've got it bad because you're in church doing all you know how to do. Well, just get crossed up with God and say, well, I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to be around them anymore. If you want to see how bad it can get, the devil will just say, ah, oh, yeah, we got a nice, lousy attitude. Now I got something to hang on to. You know, the Bible says neither give place to the devil. Yes. We're the ones that in the past we have made a platform, like they say, a landing pad for demonic spirits to trouble us, to bother us. We are the ones that have given place some kind of a opportunity, maybe through a bad attitude or unforgiveness or I just can't get over this or I don't like such and such and they may well you better stay sweet in your soul yeah. towards everybody because there is an enemy that goes around roaring like a what, like a what kind of lion a roaring lion seeking who may be who may be good to Devour The devil's in the devouring business. You see, that's why God gives us each other. Now, I know we, you know, we are all not cut out of the same cookie cutter. We don't all speak the same way. But God, I've found in the last 50 years, the Lord has sent a lot of people over my pathway that I was not expecting to meet. I didn't plan on meeting them. But I can say some of the people, you know, some of the people came across my path for bad elements, but other people came by for good elements to encourage, to uplift, to help me. And we need help. We need the help of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Don't we? Amen. Every day. Every day. It's like the song says, isn't he wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard. It's recorded in God's. Isn't he wonderful? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful. Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace. Mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer. Praise his name. But beastly behavior, he said... I was like a beast, so foolish was I and ignorant. You're gonna, we're going to make spiritual progress by being honest with the Lord. Yes. God cannot be fooled. I mean, who do we think the Lord is? Well, he doesn't see me all the time. Really? <laughs> well, he doesn't know that much about me. Really? You know, he knows all about us, and yet he loves us so much because he knows that if we'll spend time in his presence, his presence will change us. His presence will change our heart. It will soften that lousy spirit. Actually, it'll drive some of those lousy spirits away. His presence, his anointing, his love will transform you and I into something that 
we may not have thought was even possible. But beastly behavior, there's a lot of animal spirits running around in the church. It's unfortunate, but there's people tonight that are trying to put curses on this place. I don't like to say it, but that's the truth. I can feel it in my spirit. So Lord, I pray for those people that are misaligned and misled. Have mercy, have grace, because they're headed for bad things. That's why he said, pray for your enemies and those that are despitefully using because they're in trouble. Don't curse men, but bless them. A lot of people go around think, well, it's time to curse, curse people in the church. And a lot of people say, well, if you don't listen to me, you know, you're going to die and putting curses on all kinds of people. If you don't acknowledge me, if the people, you know, we've seen all kind of fleshly people, things come through this place. People trying to exalt. That's part of my note here. There's a Oh, yes, let's see. There's a peacock spirit with the great plumage. Everybody knows a peacock, right? They wander around certain towns and cities on their own, and they're actually a pest in some places. But, oh, the peacock walks around where they want to go and annoy people, and then they bring out their great big plumage. Look at my plumage. Have you ever seen that spirit in the church? Look at how great I am. I've got the word for you. A lot of people prophesy all kinds of garbage and nonsense, and people just absorb it. You're going here, and you're going to do this great thing. And I was watching something on YouTube from somebody somewhere, and, and prophecy serves to, to elevate and help people. It speaks to people. It's actually creative. But a lot of people... Instead of being told, you know, you're, you're going to make this great trip uh, to uh, Timbuktu, wherever it may be around the world, they need to tell, God's going to use you, but you've got to fix some things in your life first. Right. You, got, you have great potential, but you've got to get rid of that, os- not the ostrich, what is it? The peacock spirit. Oh, there is the ostrich spirit here on my list. I've never, you know, they say ostrich, they put their head in the sand. I, I don't, I've never seen them. You know, I guess they do. But that would be an ostrich spirit of, you know, people put their head in the sand. They're, they're content with ignorance. You remember in, the, in 1 Corinthians it says, if everybody's speaking in tongues and somebody walks in that's an unbeliever or unlearned in the things of the Spirit, won't they think you're mad? I've had people tell me things like, you know, this one guy I knew that lived out in Madras and he was living in an RV in just deplorable situations. His parents were, his mom and dad were preachers in a certain church and he had, his, his dad had died in his arms and he could not get over it. He said he could not just get over it. Well, now he's on drugs and he has all kinds of holes and scars in his arms. And he's talking about sitting out on the side thinking and how great Jesus is, why he's got all these scars of these things that are, you know, people put in their arms and all the needles and all the drugs. But I asked him one time, I said, well, did you ever receive the baptism of spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? He said, well, I never understood all that gar- or gibberish meant. You know, don't ever call something stupid or gibberish when God says it's important. There's five or six reasons or more that every believer should be speaking in tongues every day all the time because that's praying in the Spirit. That's talking, speaking in mysteries to God. That's building up yourself on your most holy faith, charging up yourself like a battery. But he said, "Eh, I never saw any any value in all that gibberish. Well, he had the ostrich spirit. Put his head in the sand and remained, was content just to be ignorant. You know, if, doesn't it say in a certain place, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In the book of uh, Revelation at the very end, it says, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. What? How can he say that at the end of the book of Revelation when Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature? Well, what he's saying is somebody wants to remain ignorant. If somebody wants to remain unholy, let them remain. If, they, if they're content, go talk to somebody that wants Jesus. Go spend your time on somebody that wants to be delivered. Sometimes, you know, we've spent so much time in the church working with people that really don't want to be delivered at all. 
We've spent time trying to cast out demons out of people that really didn't want to be delivered. One time I chased the lady down the block trying to cast the devil out of her because she, she was living down in the, on the stairwell of a church. And I said, well, you gotta, you got to move out of here. And she started cursing and swearing at me when somebody does that. Then I say, come out in the name of Jesus. I didn't just say it quietly. I got really boisterous and chased her down the block. I didn't plan on doing it, but, you know, it's in the Holy Ghost, right, sister? When the Holy Ghost hits you, you, be, you become changed into something different. Yeah. You become bold, yeah. like you never were before. Yeah. People don't understand you, but that's all right. You're understood in heaven, all right? There's a lot of bold people that are, there's a lot of people in heaven that were transformed by the power of the Lord. Amen. But that man out in Madras, well, I don't see that I need it. I don't need that tongues and I don't need to be baptized. Well, I told him. I said, well, that's the way you may think, you know, but then suddenly something came to my mind and hit me in my spirit and said, that guy's got about two years to live. What? Yeah, he'd be dead in two years. So I said, you know, you've got two years to live. Huh? Yeah, you've got about two years and that's it. Guess what? I tried to look for him online. He died about two years later. I don't like telling people that they're going to die. Sometimes, you know, we all are going to die. Okay, so guess what? You're all going to die unless you go in the rapture. Okay, But isn't it sad? God tries to help people, but it's people themselves that will not let God help them because they're harboring some hurt or I just can't get over it. Oh, my Lord. Have you ever asked the Lord, Lord, help me to get over it. Help me, Lord, to overcome. He said, now I can help you. But the ostrich spirit, well, let's go through it. Maybe there's a coyote spirit or a hyena crying. And, you know, where I live, there's in the summertime, sometimes we hear the baby coyotes howling. It's kind of interesting. Thing. What is that sound at night? You know howling and howling and howling in the darkness of the night. It's the baby coyotes in the hills of Gresham crying out for some reason, I don't know, letting themselves be known, you know. The coyote spirit, but sometimes it shows up in church. Sister was speaking a, a while ago about a snake spirit. There was some uh, revival meeting going on, and suddenly somebody had come in that had the snake spirit. They slither around, and every once in a while, they raise up their head. And when they do, get ready. There's some venom is going to come out, don't you know? But the, in the spirit, in the, in the church, it's kind of strange. You know, a certain place in Corinthians, he said, you ought to know how you ought to behave in the house of God. You know, in 1 in Timothy 3, 12, we should know how to behave in the assembly, the abiding place of God, the body of Christ. We ought to know how to behave. Some people don't know how to behave, but God will teach us how to behave. So there's the mule spirit. Haven't you ever seen the mule spirit in church? Stubborn. Well, you're not going to get me. You try to get me to do something. I'm like an old stubborn mule. It's stubbornness is a good quality in certain ways, but in certain other ways it's not. Don't be stubborn towards the things of the Lord. But the mule spirit. Then there's the bull in the china cabinet or china closet spirit. People that are just destructive. They don't know. They, they want to have influence with other people. Wouldn't you like to have influence with other people? That people think, you know, that's a wise person. Man, you need to listen to that person when they speak. I really, you know, you can say, I respect that person. Don't you want to be respected and appreciated and loved and necessary in the body? Important? Well, no, I don't care. All right. Well, maybe you've got the wrong spirit. There's other good spirits. There's a sheep spirit and an eagle spirit that we would need to be. A sheep and an eagle. An eagle that rises above the storm. Don't you want to be an eagle? To rise above the storm of life? Aren't you tired of just being down with the chickens and the, you know, the turkeys just pecking around for whatever crumbs? 
whatever crumb is on the ground, that's what I'll take. God calls us to rise above it all. Doesn't he say, I want you to soar like an eagle? Man, what kind of spirit? What kind of spirit are we entertaining? We talked about the ostrich, head in the sand, the peacock, the grandstanding, beastly behavior, the snake. God revealed to the sister, you know, there's somebody with a snake spirit. You know, they look good. <laughs> yeah, they got that snake skin coat on and the snake skin boots on, you know. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes what goes on in the church, God has to have a sense of humor, doesn't he? People love to parade around, like I said, the ostrich, you know, people say, have you seen my, you know, snake skin boots cost $2,000. I'm really blessed of the Lord. Look. Isn't that kind of strange? I just can't imagine Jesus walking around and telling the people on the Sermon on the Mount, you know. Look at what I've got on my snake butte sandals today. I'm blessed of the Lord. That's kind of strange, strange spirit. You know, even the Lord, you know, you ever read in the, in the, in the book of Daniel when Daniel, he saw that the kings of the earth, they thought they were hot shots. They thought they were so cool. And they had a vision of themselves. Oh, thou art the head of gold, O Nebuchadnezzar, and this and the silver and the brass. And, you know, the nations see themselves as such fancy things, but when God later described them, he said, you know, there's, here's a vision of the he-goat and the ram and the he-goat pouncing on each other, gnashing on each other. That's how God described the nations, not as these great, that's how they thought of they were in their own eyes, but God sees them as ravening animals, these animal spirits. Jesus even called Herod a fox. Do you remember that? Jesus had a sense of humor. He called Herod the fox. Did he not? Go tell Herod the fox that thus and so. Well, Jesus, uh, you just, Herod is not a fox, but Jesus called Herod a fox. And he called James and John the sons of thunder, didn't he? Called Peter, Peter, you're a rock, a little rock. On this big rock of revelation knowledge that you found out that, that I'm the Christ, the blessed of the Father, that was a revelation. And that revelation, that big rock, that's what I'm going to build my church on, the people that got the revelation. Oh, that I'm the Son of God, the blessed of the Father, sent of the Father. He said, the Holy Spirit revealed it to you. You're blessed. If you're in your right mind tonight, if God has revealed to you that Jesus is the Christ, you are blessed because it was the Holy Spirit that revealed that, did he not? But the fox spirit, and then the Bible talks about the dog spirit. It says some people are like a dog. They're delivered. You know, they go someplace and you know what dogs do when they're sick. Blah. And then the dog goes back to the mess that they spewed out. Some people got the dog spirit. But God doesn't want us to be that way. In another place in the Word, He says, Go to the ant, slugger. Go to the ant. The ant prepares. The ant knows how to, instinctively, the ant knows their place and they work together, not against each other. If you've seen ants running around in a single file or a and the line, they know where they're going. They And you can, in your house sometimes, maybe you, you've left a little bit, just the littlest bit of jam or jelly on the counter in your, living, in your kitchen. And in the next few hours, the army of ants, they heard about it. They smelled it. They were attracted to it. Like, who told them? You think, I gotta wipe this up, I gotta get out this, this, gotta get out the spray, I gotta call the exterminator. Yeah. These ants are smart. It's instinctively they work together. And the Bible says, in, isn't it a uh, Proverbs 6 6 or somewhere? Go to the ant. Look, they know how to work together, they know their place. They're not trying to 
Well, I got to get to the front of the lining. You rest your ants, go your own way. I'm going to do it all alone. We can't do it all alone. We need each other. And you'll get a great revelation. You'll make progress with the Lord when you realize, yeah, we need one another in the body of Christ. I can't make it on my own. Guess what? God never puts us on our own. He always puts us in a body for people to help us to know what to do. To people, for people to love us when we don't love ourselves. Amen. But go to the ant. And remember, what about a mother hen? Remember what Jesus said about Jerusalem? He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have taken you under my wings as a mother hen takes her chicks and gathers them together as a mother hen? How sacrificially we know the stories about a, a farmer that one day he, the, there was a fire out in the, in the chicken coop in the chicken yard and he was looking and he found the mother hen had been scorched and dead and then he lifted the mother hen up and out came the little chicky, the chickadees, the little chicks. The mother gave her life for the little chickens. Jesus, using that illustration to show his love for us. And he said to Jerusalem, I would have taken you under my wings and protected you, but you would not. Behold, your house is left desolate. And in 70 A.D., here came the armies, the destruction came in, and all the horrors that took place, but Jesus foretold it. But the people had their choice, but they chose Barabbas, didn't they? But all this was fulfilled so that salvation would come to us, so that our lives could be delivered. But yet, Jesus spoke of the mother hen, and in, a, in another place, it speaks about oxen. It says, where there is no oxen, the crib is clean. You ever heard that? Where there's no oxen, the crib is clean. But by much, but by the strength of the ox, there comes much a blessing. Much power comes through the strength of the ox. I remember one time in a way back in a church like 50 years ago they were doing this bus ministry where they were going out into the neighborhoods and trying to be like the Baptists and getting all the poor kids from the poor neighborhoods to come into the church and some members of the church got mad because the little kids were getting the walls dirty and their handprints were on the walls and they didn't like it and they brought it up to the pastor they're dirtying up our church <laughs> they're making the church dirty but that's the life of the church, the little ones. Where's the little ones? That's the future of the church. And here the, well, I've been in this church for 30 years, and I sit on the board, and it's going to be. Some people, the Spirit of God has left so many years ago, and they didn't even know it. And all they got left is just a ritual. It's the saddest thing in the world. A church without the Holy Spirit a church, but you got, and I've sat under and you've sat under churches where the preacher didn't even know that the Holy Spirit is not even moving anymore. Isn't that sad? Yeah. But people get that spirit. But then another place in the Bible, it talks about the conies, a little, uh, a little like a rabbit animal that makes its home in the rocks. And I, I looked it up just a little while ago, and I thought the conies would be out in the, you know, out on the beach of the ocean, and they would make, they'd be these little sea creatures hanging to the rocks as the waves would come in. The little conies would hang on and cling to the rock, but that's not the way it was. The conies live out in the desert in the rocky areas. They make their homes in the rocks, probably to be safe from the predators, building their homes in the rocks so they can hide and be safe from the predators. There's a lot of predators out there. And us alone, our vision is not clear enough to see them all. But, you know, we've got this covering of divine protection that I believe in. That we've got someone living inside of us that can see what we cannot see. He can do what we cannot do. Beastly behavior. It's 
So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. But look what he went on to say. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. You've holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Who have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all of them that go whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God, for I have put my trust in the Lord, that I may declare all thy works. He took a look at the worldly people, the lost people. Oh, they seem to sometimes have it so good. But then he said, but then I went into the sanctuary of the Lord, and then I realized, you know, the journey is not over yet. We're not home yet. So for those of you that are suffering, and I mean, people really do suffer. And just remember, we're not home yet. There is a bright and glorious future ahead. Jesus is ahead. The rapture is ahead. The second coming is ahead. The millennial reign is ahead. The resurrection of the just is ahead. I used to tell somebody, thou shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. The times when you think that, you know, does anybody know, does anybody understand the sacrifice? I told this woman minister, I said, thou shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Every wrong that you've suffered, one second in the presence of the Lord, What's that song say? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Our trials will seem so small when we see him. One glimpse of his dear face, all the sorrows of life will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ.